In an advertising career that spanned over two decades, Ted Bell learned a very particular set of skills. As the worldwide creative director of Young and Rubicam, one of the world's largest advertising agencies, Bell won every significant award the industry has to offer, including the Grand Prix at the Cannes Festival. Bell's ability to capture and hold an audience's attention, how to persuade, and how to enchant translated perfectly to his second career, the one he was always destined for as a writer of thrillers. In 2003, Bell exploded onto the thriller scene with his debut novel, Hawk, introducing the dashing Lord Alexander Hawk, British naval hero and descendant of the legendary English pirate Black Hawk. The novel drew praise from luminaries Clive Cussler, Nelson DeMille, and fellow advertiser turned author James Patterson, and launched Bell into rarefied air. Over the next 16 years, the Hawk series would produce nine straight New York Times bestsellers. The momentum continues for Ted Bell as he partners with John Adler to launch El Dorado Entertainment, a film and television production company, and his 11th Alex Hawk novel, Dragonfire, hits shelves July 21st, 2020. I'm Ted Bell, and you should be watching The Crew Reviews. Gentlemen, the crew would love to introduce Mr. Ted Bell to the show today. Good Cheers, sir. sir. Cheers. No need, no need to salute, gentlemen. I'll be on the bridge all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and we're Smoke. off to a firing start. Smoke him if you got him. Walk into meetings with the county executive at YNR. And that's what I say when I first came here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be the uh, host for today's show. So let me get right to it uh, with Mr. Bell here. So uh, Dragonfire is Lord Hawk's 11 outing, and he's been nearly, it, well, it's been 20 years since you published the first uh, Hawk book. Um, do you feel you know everything about him like an old friend? Are there things yeah. that sometimes he says that even surprise you to this day? Well, I always knew that I was going to try to make him have a, a, a kind of a sarcastic, uh, ironic sense of humor. So, you know, he when he gets in these things with uh, with Harry Brock and Stokely Jones, and um, he's as funny as, as any of them. So, but it's harder to get out, get it out of him. But yeah, I, I know him pretty well. <laughs> I mean, we're tight. Like, pretty tight, like like the back of your hand, right? It's an old friend. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, the the story of Dragonfire it spans seventy nine years, uh, if if my math is correct. Yeah. Uh, and and it it develops around the actions of the direct descendants of a Chinese ambassador. And this is one of the few times we actually get to see Alex Hawk square off against the Chinese. Right. And knowing you, that choice of antagonist doesn't happen by chance. So why China, and why now? Well, you know, I I kind of felt like I exhausted Putin. You know, once the joke that he becomes actually best friends with Hawk, <laughs> so his <it's> best friends, <laughs> <laughs> and they meet in a prison. I don't know if you guys read Czar, but it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And Putin's been thrown in prison, and then Hawk gets thrown in prison and thinks he's going to be executed. And they come, the guards drag him out of his cell at, at dawn, and he thinks he's going to, you know, take a bullet. And they, op they go down this, this cellar and they open the, a cell and it's Putin's cell. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, so they just drink vodka and smoke cigarettes all night. <laughs> and uh, and they, he says, you know, I love your work. <laughs> and, you know, whatever. And, uh, <laughs> he tries to talk to me over the KGB. And, uh, and the prison, it's called Energetica, uh, the Russian prison, uh, was built on the site of the uh, Russian Navy's uh, nuclear waste uh, disposal. So it's a totally toxic radioactive island. The whole island and the prison are radioactive. But Putin uh, has been there for a couple of months. He's got a lead line cell. He's got a you know, flat screen TV. He's got all this shit nice. in there. He's got a bar. He's got and booze. <laughs> yeah, and booze. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of booze. So yeah, no, I know him. I mean, I, maybe that's not a good answer to your question, but um, I think I feel like I know all these guys. Right. And my, the most fun for me is sitting down the first day of a new one and hearing them all start talking to each other again. Um, and it's weird. I, I, I've said this before, but when I'm writing dialogue, 
I'm not even thinking about it, what I'm doing. Huh. You know, I'm just in this zone and I'm sitting there recording what they're saying to each other. And so I have no idea what's gonna, what they're going to say next. It just comes out. And it's, it's really fun. That's the coolest part about being a writer. It's sitting back and, and listening to the, to the dialogue as it happens as Absolutely. an observer, even though it's in your head, but as an observer. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I knew Elmore Leonard a little bit because he was in advertising work, same company I did, but he was in Detroit. And uh, I, learned, I read all of his books like twice because I thought he just totally understood how to do dialogue unlike anybody else. He just was so perfect, right. perfect pitch. You know? hmm. And answer your question, yes, yes, Ted, I, I've read Czar. It's oh, okay. Let <laughs> me <laughs> pull my copy. <laughs> That's good. That's the saddest ending I've ever had in any of my books, when he's, he's full of bullet holes and, and he gets that call from his, uh, his bride-to-be telling him she's been to the doctor and it's a boy. Oh, yeah. But he's just blown her out of the sky, if you remember. He thinks he has it, boy. So he thinks right. Uh, and that was just... Uh, tears were flowing, man. But, yeah, do you get emotional when when you write stuff like that? Yeah, big yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, even it's 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 pretty amazing. I, I, even though it's fiction, it feels so real. Yeah, it does. I remember when I was working on Nick of Time, which is the first book uh, novel that I ever wrote, which I started in London and then continued working on when I moved back to New York. And so I take like the six thirty train every night up to Connecticut. And they've got in the bar car, they had these tall tables, you know, where two guys can play cards or whatever. Right. And so I'd have my laptop and I was writing Nick of Time all the way home. And I'd, I'd be writing a scene where something horrible happens to Nick and I'm, I'm crying. And, I'm, <laughs> and I've heard the other guys, that, you know, they're just getting shit faced. And they say, hey, this guy, you must like, he must hate his job. He's crying. <laughs> He's crying. <laughs> or, or, or you don't want to go home. <laughs> Actually, in those days, I did not want to go home. <laughs> I stopped going home there. Yeah. There, so. there is a whiskey called Writer's Tears. Are you, are you oh, no. I guess, the I don't person know that. that owns it? I'll go get some. <laughs> well, Ted, as, as Mike I, said... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I had a studio uh, in the, out in the back when, when I had the house in Maine. And I called it... And I had a beautiful one of those, like, ship signs with the gilt painting on, you know, carved in. And I called it the uh, writer's block. That was the writer's block. Perfect. It's <laughs> perfect. So, you know, I, I, I've seen I've seen some some of your uh, writer block uh, videos. Your like your blog or whatnot, and and I love seeing the uh, the miniature you know, the Revolutionary War figures. I think there are the red coats and whatnot on the on yeah. the sill. It's pretty cool because yeah. I I I have Civil War ones, so yeah. I thought that was pretty cool seeing those. <clears throat> well, I used to be. Um, a huge lead soldier fan. And every time I'd go to New York, my grandfather would take me to F.A.O. Schwartz and buy me a bunch of them. Wow. So it would be castle. And so what I do in my room uh, was I would set up the castle and put the soldiers all around it and out front and everything. And then I'd build a pillbox out of pillows and blow their heads <laughs> off with a BB gun. <laughs> <laughs> now they're worth a million dollars a piece. Right? I, 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 I ended up with nothing. <laughs> I did the same with firecrackers in my GI Joes in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Yep. The other good thing was to douse if you build like a, a model, like a V twenty five or 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 a you know a Coast Guard cutter or whatever. Take it out in the driveway and douse it with lighter fluid, and then run the lighter fluid back up the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> my car exploded. Flames. You just burned out an entire fortune. <laughs> My father would have had my ass if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> just rebel kits. I mean, they weren't worth anything. No, yeah, I know. that's right. <laughs> As Mike said, you know, Dragonfire is your 11th Lord Hawk novel yep. in the series. Um, and we're really excited to, to get our copy and read it. Um, but can you share with us, how do you consistently top your previous novels? What steps do you take, you know, to keep that creative juice that's going? How do you keep it fresh? Well, I, what I used to say was um, I try to write not only uh, the best that I can, but uh, better than I can. And that's my philosophy going into it. I want to be, I want to be better than I can be, you know? There you go. Absolutely. 
So Ted, you're, you're a writer um, with a knack for prescient storytelling. Uh, you write a book and reality follows suit, it seems like. Uh, your pivot to Russia when everybody was focused on the Middle East for ex is just one example. Well, I did, I'll tell you why I did that. I'm not a fan of sand. I really don't like <laughs> houses in, in, the, in the desert and, and <laughs> sand and all that crap I've got over there. And I just didn't want to write about that. And it was more, not, and I was kind of bored with, you know, how many times can you have these Al Qaeda, you know, guys? Yeah. yeah. And so I, that's when I thought of Putin and um and russia so well, other than that specific incident <laughs> do you have a process for ferreting out story threads are, are, are you looking over the horizon or is the phenomenon of of reality following your books just a grand coincidence um no i think i think i've got a pretty good handle on what's going on you know um it's really helping in advertising because i kind of knew what people were thinking uh all over the country um, but I just, I just pay attention to, to things. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's a, maybe I'm just getting lucky, you know? I don't think it's luck. Nah, it's no, there's way. no luck. No there. way. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're able to read the tea leaves. You see, you see basically yeah. what you just said, where, where are things going and you just instinctively just know and you follow that path. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad that I went back to China in this book based on the fact that the virus, you know, um, yeah, but I, I finished it before I got to put the virus in. But I don't think I need the virus in this one. I think it's the way it is. Yeah, not this one. I love how you tied in. You tie in Pearl Harbor, uh, yeah. World War II. You know, I just love reading about World War II history. You tie in Pearl Harbor, and and then you you know you tie it in all to today. And like you said, you bring the Chinese into it. It's just yeah, yeah. It's, um. So Dragonfire is the first novel on a two book deal with Penguin Random House. Um. So for us mere mortals on the crew here, hmm. what's the process like switching publishing companies when a character city series is, is, is kind of already established? Um, well, I had lunch with Tom and, uh, and he read uh, part of the Dragonfire uh, manuscript. And I just, his comments were just right on the money. And hmm. I, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not gonna say any name, but I did not have a good editor for the last four books. Hmm. Or, I mean, the guy didn't really didn't really edit at all. I think he mm. had his secretary do it. Wow. Um, but it was, you know, it was. I didn't really have an editor, and my agent at that time was not a good editor. Now I've got a great agent and, and a great editor, so I think I'm ready to roll again. Nice. You can't go wrong with Tom Colgan. No. Oh, love this guy. Yeah, we do too, for sure. Well, on that on that end, can you? Without too much inside baseball, can you give us a little bit of a description, thumbnail description of, of your working relationship with Tom? How does that work? Um, well, we, I just talked to him on the phone, you know. Um, and then, you know, it's just, it's just like any other writer and his editor. I mean, it's just there's no nothing unusual about it. We just we're kind of on the same page, you know. You know, work work through ideas, big picture type stuff, or does he get, does Tom get into the minutia? Well, well, the day I called him and said I was putting Ian Fleming in the book as a major character, he, he was like silent. <laughs> 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 I said, okay, he either loves it or he thinks I'm crazy and he hates it. So, <laughs> Have you figured out what his response actually is? <laughs> Effing loves it. <laughs> ah, awesome. Of course. Awesome. Um, and staying with Ian Fleming, uh, I, I've heard that, you tell a story that James Bond really saved your life. Yeah, I, it's actually changed my life is better, but saved is good. Um, yeah, so I grew up in a small town on the Gulf of Mexico, and nothing ever happened. And you know, I put playing cards in the wheel of my bike. Yeah, sound like a motorcycle. That was high excitement. <laughs> your Mickey Mantle cards. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you know it was just it was it was a really small sleepy little town. It's boring. Uh -huh. And so the summer I was thirteen, I discovered Ian, and he totally changed my worldview. From a guy who's bored and and lonely in a little town to a guy who's going to go out and see the world, and go to all those places and stay in those hotels, get an Aston Martin, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and that it did. I and I never, uh, I never looked back. You know, I got to New York as soon as I could, and um, and started you know traveling all over the world. Just loved it. And I think if I hadn't read those books, I don't know. I wouldn't just gone to college and. My family was in the banking business, so I had an easy job there. And but I didn't, so it was great. So, so I got something. <laughs> yeah. So at my college graduation, my grandmother said, "What are you going to do now?" I said, "I'm going to go to Princeton and get a PhD and to be an English professor." She said, "Who's going to pay for that?" <laughs> <You're paying. laughs> I'm not paying for it. I said, "Why?" She said, "You're going to come down and work in the bank." And I said, "I don't think so." She said, I'll make you a deal. Because I had sent a manuscript to Doubleday that I wrote in college and got one of those, it's great, but not for us letters, you know? Yeah. It's the only rejection letter I ever got. Wow. And um, so she said, I'll make you a deal. If you'll come down and work in the bank for one year and you don't like it, I'll give you a year in Europe to finish your book. Deal. Done. So I moved to Switzerland. And then wrote the book. The book sucked, but you know. <laughs> but first it started you on the right path. Yep. Sorry, it started you on the right path. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Wow. Do you think that was true for a lot of uh, uh, young men and, and women, you know, in, in your era at that time, in terms of just seeing a, a broader world that you never would have had an opportunity to see without books like Ian's? We were obsessed with him in 007. I remember me and like four or five fraternity brothers went into Richmond and went to a gun store and bought small handguns and leather concealed carry holsters here. And we start wearing them around the fraternity. <laughs> 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 like we were spies or whatever. It was like really cool. This doesn't end well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so staying, staying on the, the focus of James Bond, um, James Patterson says that Alex Hawks is the new James Bond. Um, so talk to us about um, Ian Fleming's character, James Bond, and how did it really serve as a model for Alex Hawk when you started uh, that novel? No, because I, I mean, I knew if I tried to make him like Bond, it was going to not end well. Okay. Hmm. So, um, so I did everything I could to make it, you know, that's why I have, gave him a great sense of humor. Uh, he gets very emotional about his son. Uh, and, you know, Fleming is quoted as saying he wanted Bond to be the gray man. Ah. You know, the civil servant that nobody knows who he is or what he does. Hmm. And he, if you read Bond, I mean, his, his character never really develops. It's always, it's pretty much the same straight through. How many, <clears throat> how many Bond books were there? I can't remember. Oh, Fleming, I'm not even sure because there's been so many written by other people. It's yeah, blurred. not counting those. Yeah. yeah. Ian's, I don't even know. But yeah, I think that uh, my whole generation was obsessed with 007. Yeah. We just thought it was fantastic. And mm -hmm. then I read a book that you guys might want to read if you want some insight. Is There's a, a, a book called, um, what happened to the title right? How James Bond Saved England. That's hmm. the premise. Okay. And he did it because he gave him a hero to root for at a time when that country was in the toilet. Right. Yeah. All right. People were eating shoe leather. Right. And all of a sudden there's this English hero that the whole world is in, is in awe of. And so it really lifted the spirits of the English people in a way that's probably not acknowledged very much, but it's true. Hmm. I'll definitely look that one up. Yeah. You, we've discussed, touched on this a little bit. You were wildly successful advertising exec and creative prior to becoming a writer. Um, what skills and lessons from that career translated to your career as a novelist and what did you have to develop? Um, well, that's really easy because when I was making 30 and 60 and 90 second commercials, right, with huge budgets, hmm. um, we were spending more money uh, per frame than any Hollywood blockbuster. On wow. Some we did an AT&T commercial, the last one I did, which we shot in the Mekong Delta. And my friend Ed, who was a Swift boat captain, was with me. And we shot with a guy named Joe Picta, who was like 
all the major Super Bowl commercials from Budweiser and, and Joe Shot, and he became a really good, still is a good friend of mine. And so we we flew a crew in uh, from England, and we had, and then and Ed managed to get uh, find somebody who would like send catered food from Paris. <laughs> so we're we're in, the, we're in the Mekong Delta. And we had these two communist minders. Uh, and they were both women, and they were just, you know, bitches on wheels. I gotta tell you, you can't shoot that. Yes, we can. No, you can't. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so it's a really cool commercial. It's about a black marine who's on leave, and he went to Vietnam, and he was so moved by it, he called his dad, and his dad says, um, "Yeah, you in Manila, son?" He said, "No, sir, I'm in Vietnam." Yeah, because his dad was in Manila, but never oh. talked about it. Never said a word about it. Yeah. And uh, he said, Vietnam, you want to talk about that, son? He said, yes, sir, I do. And that's the end of the commercial. And we got uh, Crosby, we got David Crosby to re-record a uh, long time coming. What was it called? Long time, you know, it'll be a long time. What is that song? Remember Crosby? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to like it now. Anyway, he re-recorded it in the studio for us. <coughs> and wow. it was a fabulous, fabulous what? play. What's the budget for something like that back five, then? I think that was probably five. five million. Wow. For a 30 second spot or 60 oh, no, second? No, no. A 60 and a 90. And it was, it ran in cinema too. Oh, okay. wow. Well, it was fun. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fun. It's pretty I mean, amazing. I mean, I can't it myself. <laughs> you know, like, okay, now you're in Monte Carlo. You know. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Staying at the Carlton Hotel <laughs> and you know, just driving around, you know, with a top down, and like this is you're getting paid to do this. It's like, Dude, life, life is good. Sometimes wow. you get the bear. Sometimes you get the bear. <laughs> right, Shawnee? <Yes. laughs> True. What'd you say? I didn't hear it. No, I said sometimes. Sometimes the bear gets you. We had a saying in the Secret Service. Sometimes the bear gets you, and sometimes you get the bear. Meaning you, know, you, <laughs> you win the whole thing, man. That's awesome. What a life. That yeah, was good. Really fun. Hey, Ted, you joined forces with film producer Jonathan Adler, yep. um, and you guys created a, a production company, El Dorado Entertainment. Yes. So what can you tell us uh, where you're at with uh, some Alex Hawk um, um, or big screen uh, um, you know, type work? Are there any, any other projects I'll besides you, that? I'll tell you a couple of really exciting things about this, because the company's not even six months old. Wow. And John, my partner, who lives uh, in Greenwich, where I, my other house is, and um, he grew up with Ron Howard as his mentor. Wow. And so he's, he's best friends with Ron. Wow. Ron put him through USC film school. And, wow. and he's uh, writing, he's written and produced one feature film called Block Island. Um, and he's, he's working on some more. And... So I just folded all of my quote unquote film projects into El Dorado. Ted, we're talking a little bit about Hollywood. What are your rules, since you've had a lot of experience with it, um, what are your rules for dealing with Hollywood? Um, you, you gave an interview one time that we saw, I think it was in 2018, it said, don't listen to anybody except the food service people. Those people know everything that's going on in production. <laughs> <laughs> so Hemingway has a great quote. He says, if you ever sell one of your books to Hollywood, here's what you do. Take your manuscript, throw it in the back of your convertible, put the top down and drive to California. When you get to the state line, get your book, get out of the car, heave your book over the fence into <laughs> California, get in your fucking car and drive back home. <laughs> that's true. You did say that. So that's kind of how I feel about them. I mean, they, the, the stuff that you deal with is just ridiculous, you know. And is it just is it egos or I mean what is it? What? They, they just they don't they don't. Um, who is it that wrote this thing uh, about? They just don't, they don't have respect for writers, you know, or the process. They think they're like they're gods, and we're just mm -hmm. like we're just there to serve them. Yeah, you know. So Paramount bought the Hawk rights uh, a year and a half ago. Again, not the Hawk one, not Nick, and. I never had a phone call from anyone at Paramount to wow. say, can we talk about how you see this? I never had. Uh, my producer, who was like 
Lorenzo de Bonaventura, who was an amazing, he did Perfect Storm and he did the, uh, all the Transformers movies. I mean, he's like one of the, if not the most powerful producer in Hollywood. So after a couple of lunches with him, just to get me hooked into it, I never heard from him. Um, and they, so they let the option run out. But huh. it's, just, it's outrageous um, the way they treat us. Don Winslow wrote an article this week for Deadline that, uh, if you haven't read it, that's I'll the article I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah I read that. a I read really that. good article. I, I I wish that everyone in Hollywood would read it. <laughs> I hope it's going to be in Deadline, right? So they yes. will. Read it. Yes, it is. Um, I almost sent it to my guy at CAA, who's no longer at CAA. He's now got his own company, but he's kind of my manager in LA. Mm -hmm. And I almost sent it to him, or because I sent it to John Adler, and I almost CC'd him, but I thought. Probably you wouldn't be too thrilled hearing what I have. <laughs> it needs to be circulated out there because yeah. you're right. There are people who really, really do respect the authors, but then they're the minority. The vast majority are just, they just need content and they don't care where it comes from or yeah. who. Well, Jim said that the most complete experience he ever had was working with Coppola. Oh. So. Um, hmm. That would be an awesome experience. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hey, uh, Ted, you have um, in, in, in your home, I think it's the your home in Connecticut, the farmhouse in Connecticut, you have a place you have labeled Writer's Block. I think it's by that windowsill. You also put out a newsletter called Writer's Block. But how does Ted Bell, how does the great Ted Bell deal with Writer's Block? I don't really get it. Oh, I knew that'd be your answer. Of course. <laughs> <Just don't. laughs> you know, I don't know what it is. Antibodies. <laughs> Let's suck out his plasma, boys. Let's get some. <laughs> I watched the video one time. You said, uh, I mean, you were joking, but you're like, I, I deal with the writer's block. I just steal shit. I steal from this. I steal from that. I steal from this. <laughs> no, my rule in advertising was if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Right. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> if that's a crime just so, go for the ghost so, so so guys ted goes i think you made that point in that in that one video i watched and you like it and who's the best me i'm gonna steal from myself <laughs> <laughs> I never, I never. that's so funny well ted you survived the main portion of our interview but now we take you into the dark realm called the lightning round <laughs> This will test you like no other. Uh, I'd light a cigarette and I just calm down. <laughs> sure. Whatever. You want a blindfold too? <laughs> You're in your home. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> All right. So this will be a um, series of questions. There's no thought put into this. So we don't really require any kind of thought with your answers. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and since I've uh, got the uh, helm here, I'm going to go first. Okay. So, uh, how many times a day are you confused as being an Englishman? <laughs> um, almost never. What? Um, really? Yeah, I mean, I don't have an English accent. I can do a, I can do a good accent, you know? <laughs> but when, when people... I, I, had, I, I had a driver, which is one of the reasons I went to YNR. I said, well, I, well I not only get you a house in, in South Kensington, we're going to get you a car and driver if you're on. How about that? Does that sound good, Ted? I said, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> But my driver was this cockney guy named David. And my brother and sister-in-law came and stayed with us in London for a week or so. And I was working, so I didn't need David. So my brother and his wife drove around with him all day. So they left, and then he picks me up on the next Monday morning and said, you like Chinese, Cub? And I said, I'm sorry, David? You like Chinese? Your brother, Mitch, he loves his Chinese. Every time we go by a Chinese restaurant, he said, pull over here, David. Get some Chinese food, <laughs> something like that. But it was, I mean, so I could do it, a Cockney accent. I'm not so upper class accent, so good. Well, I think, I'm sorry, to Mike's point though, like when I read Hawk, yeah. I assumed you were English. Yeah, I, me too. I, I, no, that's not, I did hear that a lot. Yeah, I, mean, I was surprised when I found out you were I think, no, you're right. But you said how many times a day. Like, Ted, like Mike said before, he didn't put much thought into this. So. No. <laughs> That's what? as deep as I get. Mike didn't put much thought into it. <laughs> All right. Question number two. The crew is looking for an advertising campaign to grow the business. 
Mm. What sort of imagery would you recommend to capture the essence of the program? <clears throat> wow. I don't know. I'm really good at this stuff too. I, I don't, I don't think I know enough. Mm. It's you know, just all about booze. It's, well, it's I drinking. Say, I would say to clients that, you know, were new clients, uh, when I had my first meeting with them, uh, I would say, okay, here's what I want you to do before we even start talking. I want you to say in one sentence, what you guys, what it is that you guys stand for and what you do. And that was always the kind of the basis for whatever we ended up doing. So it's an alcohol commercial, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it would be a, a flask in the shape of a novel. That would there be our, <laughs> would be the essence of our show. <laughs> oh man. All right. So with that alcohol theme in mind, my last mm. question is this. Ted Bell decides to produce the most exclusive rum on the planet. What is the name of your drink? Oslings. Oh, Dark and Stormy. <laughs> you haven't know. thought about this He's at all. About this one. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's, that's easy. <laughs> is Malcolm Gosling, is, I go to Bermuda a lot. And Malcolm Gosling is a really good friend of mine. He's a great guy. He's really funny. And uh, so I was invited to, to uh, a reception for, at his annual golf tournament in Bermuda. And uh, somebody came over and said, um, Ted, Mr. Gosling would like to talk to you. And I said, really? He doesn't even know me. He said, no, he wants to talk to you. So I went over and sat down with him. He said, I just love your books. I love seeing my Gosling's rum in your books. Oh, of course. Well, I said, wait, wait till you get product placement in the major feature film. You're going to really love it. Yeah. <laughs> So I have to tell you, my father, talking about alcohol, my father lived to be 96, but he drank a lot more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so when I was a kid and they were having a party, he would call me over to, you know, with all, all adults, he would call me over and say, son, go over that, see that bartender over him. Tell him to put a little patch on this drink. Tell me it's not broken. You don't have to start over. Just put a patch on this one. And I said, yeah, dad, okay. A so, patch. So, so I said to him one time, uh, Dad, what, why, do you, why don't you just go get your own drink? What, why do I have to go get it for you? He said, that's because of one thing, son. Sneaking a second drink past your mother is like sneaking dawn past a rooster. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. Smart, Smart man. <laughs> Tagline for the show. He's like 95, he goes to the doctor because he's complaining of like dizzy spells. And he says, T.A., when do you have this thing? He said, ah, you know, early evening. He said, do you still have a cocktail around that time? He said, yes, sir, I do. He said, how many cocktails do you have? He said, let me just put it this way for you. My wife puts stuff on the table at 7 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, I start drinking as much as I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> he was good on that subject. That's fantastic. Oh, uh, there's got to be a good, book of just truisms. Good sense of humor. <laughs> Did have a good season. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, that was that was my turn, and I'm going to turn over the helm now for the next set of questions here. I, I am up. Ted, um, Lord Alex Hawk can date one leading lady from the golden age of Hollywood. Who is the lucky lady? Scarjo. Pardon me. Uh, uh, Scarjo. What is? What's oh, the Scarjo. Name? Now, okay, gotcha. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, she's. She's something else. That's what about from the golden age? Like from, you know, the, the 40s through the 60s, say. Yeah. Say again? I said, what about through the golden age from like the 40s through the 60s? Marilyn. Mm. Marilyn Monroe. Good enough for John Kennedy. He's good enough for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> okay. Question number two. Finish this sentence. Real men are never afraid to... Brock. Amen. The answer. Absolutely. Amen. And my final question, you're a, a traveled man, which we've discussed uh, uh, during the course of the interview. Uh, your next book has to be written in one of two places. It's going to either be in London, a flat in London, or an apartment in New York City. Which one and you why? Physically writing or setting the story there? Uh, physically writing. You're going to have to actually go to that city to write the entire novel and stay there until you finish. London or, or, or New York? And London. why? London's my favorite city. Yeah. In my favorite year, I spent, I was made, I was uh, elected as a visiting scholar at Cambridge University. In, right. 
and also a, a writer in residence. And but I had to set uh, set the novel in, in at Cambridge, and I can't remember which one it was now. It might have been Patriot. I don't know. But I did spend a year in England writing writing one of the books. Writing the book. That's pretty cool. Good spot to spend. Um, spend yeah. time writing a story. Amazing time. Yeah. Ted, if you were if you were not who you are today, but instead were a master thief, what was the what would be the one thing in the world that you would want to steal and get away with? The Hope Diamond. Hope that Diamond. Hope diamond. Beautiful. Ooh. That thing is beautiful. <laughs> <It's like> <laughs> <laughs> and where it. would you be able to sell it on the market? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'd steal is a is a massive sailing yacht. Sailing yacht. Uh, Sail away on it. <laughs> It's pretty cool. You gotta get the you gotta get a crew then. You gotta yeah. steal the crew. Well, since we're having dead man talk, you guys want to hear about the next one? Yeah, let me pause it. Oh yeah, sure. go ahead. We we'll do that down the road. No, let's do hey, it we'll, right after the interview. We'll do it right, let's after, do it right this. after this. Yeah. Um, so let's hurry up real quick. Do you think FDR allowed Pearl Harbor to happen? No. no. And Russia, China, or I've ourselves? Heard and I, it's just bullshit. Yeah. I know. <laughs> He was an amazing guy, and I have enormous admiration for him. There, there were a whole bunch of hoax uh, conspiracy theories that he actually let that happen to get us into the war. But I, I like you, I think it's complete and utter bullshit. No, he, he got us into the war to, to, to help out Churchill. Churchill, yeah. yeah. Churchill was going down. Right. right. England was going down, and they were going to be invaded. Right. Unless he stepped in. That's why he went into World War II. Yeah. Yep. Nothing to do with it. You know? And so now if we go to the future, uh, present now, uh, the all Russians. That, uh, all that, that storyline of, of what I just said is all in Dragonfire, by the way. Oh, here we awesome. go, people. Awesome. From nice. Us. Russia, China, or ourselves, Ted? Say again. The United States. Who's the greatest enemy in the world? China. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. 100%. Agreed. People are too afraid to even think about it right well you now. could you could have said that months ago you didn't have to wait until just the latest thing i mean right oh i mean they're, they're developing laser technology that can just shut us down right and we're behind yeah space that's why we have a space force yep. yeah all right you're almost out of the woods but you still have to get through me <laughs> so my first question is have you ever introduced oh, yourself like guy take Pardon me? I, the, How much lightning can one man take? Yeah, it's, oh. it's, we, we got three more again. bolts. We, <laughs> three more bolts. <laughs> and we, we've capped the number at 12. Um, <laughs> so have you ever introduced yourself as Bell, Ted Bell? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I would if I were you, Ted. That'd be like, that'd be like having me, Alex Hawk say, Hawk, Alex Hawk. One yeah. <laughs> I like Bell better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who is your favorite British royal, living or deceased? The Queen. The Queen. Queen? Classy, classy lady. Yeah. Incredibly strong woman. Yeah, she's great. Awesome. Did you see her address to the nation? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, she's unbelievable. Perfect. Right. I wish our president would do that. She really is extraordinary. Right. Okay, my last question. You are exceedingly well traveled. Yes. This is a bonus question. <laughs> yeah, this uh, is the last one. Last if, you get one. It, if you get it right, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you win a drink. <laughs> you are exceedingly well traveled and have lived in numerous places, both at home and abroad. What? Where was the most beautiful sunrise, and where was the most beautiful sunset? Wow, that's a great question, actually. Um, <laughs> God, I don't know. So. I used to go to Cannes every summer for the film festival, right? Yep. For the advertising film festival. And we would go to these, all, and all my buddies in advertising were, were out there, and we were all just hanging out in the south of France. So we'd go to this hotel, Majestic, and we'd go to the bar, and we'd stay there. And you, we'd be walking back to the hotel, and I'd say, why is it light out? <laughs> <laughs> it was light out at sunrise. It's just happened. <laughs> we were still in there drinking. So that was the prettiest sunset, I would say, was in the South of France. South of France? Um, sunrise, I mean. And sunrise. Sunset. God, I don't know. I grew up in Florida on the West Coast, so I saw a lot of beautiful sunsets. Yeah, I'd say. Oh, yeah. That's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Key West is a good place to watch that happen. I love Key West. Yep. Well, you survived the lightning round and the main portion. Okay. So congratulations, good sir. Hopefully uh, you uh, come out of this without too many medical issues. So <laughs> we want to raise a toast to the incomparable Ted Bell. Thank you, guys. Thank thanks you sir. so much, sir. Thanks for coming on. With you. Everybody by Dragonfire. We want to thank Mr. Ted Bell for coming on the program today. New Alex Hawk book coming out, Dragonfire. Ooh. Get it. Do it. Thank you, sir. And every Monday, we have another best-selling author coming on the program. And today, gentlemen, toast. It's a fantastic interview. To the Mr. Ted Bell. That's awesome. Look awesome. at that. Cheers, Drink sir. Up, boys. To Alex Hawk. You get a perfect take and you won't be recording. <laughs> I almost caught that. Just like yesterday. All right. We want to thank Mr. Ted Bell for coming on the program today. What a wonderful career. He continues to put out some of the best writing in the history of whatever. All right. <laughs> no. And no. Better than the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Ted Bell. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John got nothing on Ted Bell. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Ted. <laughs> Take 10. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The crew would love to thank Mr. Ted Bell for coming on the program today. And Chris's JS hands aren't going to screw me up. <laughs> they did. See, see how that went? That was pretty smooth, actually. Transition. Is this a first for you? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a virgin. I'm a wow. virgin. <laughs> we were too when we started this. <laughs> my Zoom virginity. <laughs> That's a they promo right there, that. boys. That's a promo. <laughs> <laughs>